Hello, everyone. Welcome to our bonus podcast. I'm the host, Donatas Rubanas, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Augusta Shulauskas and Rita Svishnauskas. Uh, hello, guys. Hello. Hello. Last week, we wrapped up the Eurobasket experience, and we're just two weeks away from the start of the EuroLeague season. So for this episode, we will do the power ranking for the upcoming EuroLeague season. So we'll go from 18th to the first uh, seed, explaining our picks and trying to uh, kind of preview the upcoming uh, EuroLeague season. Let's let's start with the last one, 18th seed. I have uh, Alba Berlin in there. Okay. I mean, it's uh, uh, we always support continuity uh, from the other teams, but not when you have... I mean, it's not that they could have done a lot of with the budget they have, but uh, when you have probably the least amount of talent in the EuroLeague, it's, it's not a good sign uh, when you have all the same players uh, from the team. I know uh, yesterday Ericsson got injured for three to four months. I know that's that that's opens up the door for Jalene Smith and Maud Law to have amazing seasons, but I just think it, it's not going to be enough to, to get from the bottom, from the 18th uh, spot. They are going to steal some games playing, you know, different style of basketball that they continue to play uh, after Aito Renesas went out from the team, but um, I just don't see them being much higher than, okay, the last or the 17th place. Honestly, I I have like six or seven teams which are so close quality-wise and let's say season limitations-wise that one injury, one error, some luck can change teams for like from 13th seed to 18th seed. So I actually put Alba way higher and the 13th seed actually just because oh, okay. i love the backcourt of mao Dolo and jalen smith jalen smith was improving um, huge in the second part of the season he became a very important piece of that successful late playoff uh push let's say in the end of the regular season mao Dolo was showing some great great games in the eurobasket and the last year league season as well was probably the most improved player so you have a very solid backcourt uh, we have another super creative big Luke Sigma and a lot of uh, rotation players, the continuity, the same coach. They have like, uh, they're bringing back 13 of 15 uh, main roster players. And compared to all the other teams I have on this bottom list, like uh, Basconia, Valencia, Jargiris, Pantnaikos, even as well, they had the least changes. So that might help, especially if we discuss this mm. complicated preparation uh, f for the EuroLeague season. Mm. This team, of course, they also missed a lot of players b due to national team uh, uh, duties. But I just think that they it might give them slight advantage in a pool which is very close level-wise. So just, just because of that, I put them higher, but I wouldn't be surprised to see them. Okay, maybe not the last, in the yearly standings, but 17th, for example. I think that they are a nice team and they're a pretty fun, exciting fun team to watch. to watch. Yeah, because of Luke Sigma, because of Maudolo and because of the style of basketball. But honestly, Maudolo and Johannes Thiemann are, are crucial players to this team and they had a very deep Eurobasket run. And as, as we were talking about a possible downfall somewhere in the middle of the season, it might happen to these players because both of them never had an experience like this fighting for a medal in a Eurobasket. So it might be difficult. And and Marcus Eriksson injury also hits them hard. Yeah, that's I, a game changer. I, I know you put them so high, I, I didn't have this. I know you're going to depend on Jalen Smith a lot more than last season because he seems like more adapted to the game. Uh, but um, honestly, I have them as a 17 seed, even though I kind of cheer for them. I kind of like the whole idea of this team uh, Playing by the book, let's say. They have the yeah. budget limitations. They always try to find some hidden, hidden gems. gems. Yeah, like this this time it's Gabriele Procida. Maybe this young Italian will surprise us. Probably they're looking for a new Simone Fontecchio. 2.0. <laughs> yeah, so anyways, I have them as 17th. And in my 18th seed as a, in, in the power rankings is uh, Asvel Villabon. Um, they added amazing experience by signing two French veterans, uh, Nando De Colo and, and Geoffrey Lovain. But at the same time, they're going to be very dependent on them. And we know that Geoffrey Lovain is really injury prone. Nando De Colo also had some same. injuries in, in recent years. So knowing that the French league is very physical, 
uh, it could be a difficult season for for these veteran players. And other than them, I don't really see a big spark on that roster. And actually, in some positions, as we talked, especially in the power forward spot, they look empty handed. So. Um, I just think they're going to struggle a lot, it, especially knowing that most of these EuroLeague teams, they play switch all defense, they play very physical defense. Or from Nando De Colo, every year it gets harder. Uh, like in the first game week, they're, they're facing uh, Milan. So Nando De Colo is going to be constantly attacking Heinz or, or, or Davis. Yeah, so I have them as the 18th seed, even though... Uh, they will be a competitive bottom team, even if they finish in the very bottom of the EuroLeague. This season, we don't have a team that's that's like an easy walk in a park for, for others. Yeah. I, you know, they signed two score. You say they're not going to have a spark, but uh, they signed two interesting guys in Cartwright Jackson. And John Amatis. Uh, and John Amatis. They both had huge scoring seasons, uh, one in Germany and the other one in, in the Poland League. So... I don't know how they will, you know, transfer their game to the the biggest uh, level of of of, Euro of Europe, but um, I can see one of them being uh, really an efficient scoring immediately. At least, at least one of two. Yeah, Where but do you rank them. Sorry. Where do you rank them? Seventeenth. Uh, Seventeenth. Uh, I have as well. Eighteen. Alba. Alba right. Yeah, I have as well in, in the last place actually, just because of the reasons you mentioned. Also, they're lacking of depth. Uh, they're clearly missing position Forward. four player. Yeah, they're of course they're on the market, but let's see what they're gonna bring. They were about to sign Livio John Charles, but CSK uh, got him in the last minute. So, do you they're think they're playing uh, Lovern and fall well, together for to the start of the season? They might. Ha I mean, probably they won't have any other choice, but it's already sounds like a not very good idea. At least some minutes, you, you know. It's, it's it will look something like the French national team when, when Poirier plays with Mustafa yeah. Fall. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a big teams, fan of it. Against I'm, some teams, it did work. <laughs> it did, but yeah. I'm not a big fan of this 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 model. Let's move on. Okay, so for the seventeenth, you have I had as well as well. So Alba and as well. You as well in the bottom well, Alba, Alba 17. I have Jargiris as my 17th team. I think that they improved because it's hard not to improve the <laughs> roster compared to the last season. Uh, it will be more defensive minded, more athletic team, but still, even with these improvements, they're just lacking of talent. I think that they might face issues uh, offensively because they only have Keenan Evans and uh, Ignaz Brasdekis as, let's say, shot creators, scorers. And then you look like Edgar Solanovas, Arnas Butkiewicz, Roland Schmitz, uh, Kavarius Hayes. Okay, Tyler Kavanaugh, he can stretch the floor. But, I mean, I think that they might face some huge problems uh, offensively. And they're just not talented enough to be in a conversation, at least to be in the playoff uh, mm. conversation like 12th or 15th seed and as I said the margin between these last 6-7 teams is, is really really small but I just I tried to compare them with Panayakos for example or, or, or Red Star but at some situations I found more advantages on, on other teams I'm, I might I, I would like to switch them with Panayakos I have them as my 16th uh, seed team but I just think that in some situations they have a little bit more talent. Although I think that chemistry-wise, team-wise, Jalgiris will be also a uh, competitive, let's say, um, hard-working team, y which you would like to cheer for, uh, the way they're going to play. Yeah. But for me, it's I like uh, for them to win consistently, they have everybody from their starting lineup have to play a great game. Like there is, if Keenan Evans struggles, you're probably not winning that game. If Ignas Brasdakis has a down game, you're probably not winning it because you don't just have enough uh, role players who can score points, and uh, it's it's just too much depending on the on these couple of players in the in the starting lineup. So I don't see them getting much higher than the 16, 15 spot. Although, as you said, the last six teams are really close to each other. So. Um, I don't know, Ritis. Number 16? Think? We cannot yeah, please have, Lithuanian fans, yeah. I see. I have them, wait, 15 or 16? I have them 15. For me, they're number 16 in the power rankings. Uh, well, the reasons are more or less the same. Uh, I don't like the depth chart of this team. 
like the starting lineup is okay. I watched them yesterday in the first Lithuanian Basketball League game, and I thought that the starting lineup really could work for EuroLeague because you have size, you have physicality, you, you have all these tools, you have a good playmaker, uh, Keenan Evans and Ignas Brzdekis, who might actually be a solid EuroLeague player. But then when, when the coach starts rotating and, and substituting players, uh, the second unit looks like EuroCup quality at best. So I think in a long EuroLeague season, a deep bench gives you such a huge advantage. And in this case, Algiers just don't look like they have it. And too many players, again, in my opinion, that are there mainly for Lithuanian passport. <laughs> they shouldn't be. They don't belong in EuroLeague. I'm, I'm being honest. Berutis, Lukashunas, Dimsha, they don't belong yeah. in EuroLeague. They're just Lithuanians. So um, 16th seed, okay. They will be more way more competitive than last season. They should yeah. be much better on defense. They have some interesting players uh, that could play a breakthrough season, yeah. like Kevarius Hayes, for example. Uh, I hope they will do better than I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. expecting, but... We are all hoping, though. Yeah. The, this year really looks crazy strong, actually, so it's, it's hard to predict some very positive results. The only other positive thing that I see from them is that they have players in in the starting, you know, the main players are hungry to show that mm -hmm. they belong to the EuroLeague elite. You have Evans, you have Brzdekis, you have Roland Schmitz, who had a minor role at Saint Barcelona. You have Cavaris Hayes, who is just coming from the Euro Cup. So, you know, this dog mentality that Bursaspor had last season and helped them to go to the Euro Cup final. So, this could be the spark mm -hmm. that helps them to, you know, let's say. Um, surpass our expectations well, one thing we, bo more. we all agree on is, is that they look way more modern than oh, yeah. last season at least now they they really emphasize the right places like physicality ability to to defend multiple yeah. positions the switch. Switch. ability from first uh, yeah from one a to point five. guard that is capable of creating his own shot that is yeah. keenan evans so at least that and hopefully hopefully everyone stays healthy and they could have a decent season Okay, so let's move on then. Um, who's your number 16? Uh, Servena Zvezda. Servena Zvezda. Okay. Why? I mean, last season for me was the example of how a small budget team should play in the EuroLeague and uh, Servena Zvezda was the number one example, you know, hard defense. I don't see them playing uh, with the new additions in the backcourt. I don't see them having the same kind of defense that they had last year. Uh, Jalen Adams and Nemanja Nedovic are great offensive players, although I have some questions about how Adams is going to, you know, um, adjust to the European game after after Australia. But uh, they're going to score more, more easier than the last year, but they're not going to be that good defensively in my eyes. Also with the, you know, the switch in the in the coachings coaching position. So I just don't see them winning that many games as last last year. And they have four centers in my eyes. That's it's good, but also at the same time, how are you gonna fit them all together on the court? I don't mm. know. Well, I have well, them a little mm. bit higher. The thing that I like about them is um, like last season when we were talking about Zvezda, what are they missing? They were missing shooters and they were missing a mobile center. And they yeah. signed Hassan Martin, which is a good addition because obviously you're going to play some minutes with Kuzmic and, and Petrushev. Both of these uh, big Serbians will be attacked on, uh, with pick and rolls all the time. And here you have Hassan Martin. He's capable of switching. He's, he's sort of a budget Kyle Hines. So that's a good signing. Nedovic, we don't know if he's going to be healthy. That's always the biggest question mark about him. You know, something that he's top 10 player in the EuroLeague, but I don't really... No, nah, agree with that. No, nah, I don't think so. Really. Oh, just... um, <laughs> and and <laughs> let's just not even start this conversation. <laughs> and the coach again, I don't have too much info about the coach. I don't know what he's capable of. Maybe he's a very talented young coach. We will see. I have them a little bit higher than than you do. You have them at sixteen, but um, not. Too I might high. have been too harsh on that, though. No, nah, I mean, yeah, they, they should maintain that hard working team that's always For playing sure. good at home. Mm. But on They're the road, as we know, on the road, they, they, they sometimes tend to struggle. Do you think guys, uh, John Holland is, a, you know, the same 
level of player as Nikola Kalinic was for this team. Oh no, there's no. you cannot even compare them. Yeah, so that's I mean, that's one more. I think uh, they're position missing Kalinic, where, where they they're missing Gradonic, who said the. Uh, let's say the tone for the whole system for their defensive mentality yeah. as you mentioned they're missing better uh, defensive uh, backcourt uh, players but i put them higher because i just like their lineups mostly offensively they're gonna have a huge fan support jalen adams is a very interesting x factor nyamanya nedovic and his health is a big if but then you have these uh, players who can help defensively, like John Holland, Ben Bentel can stretch the floor. These uh, role players like Luka Mitrovic or even Ogyan Dobrich, he might have a good season. Uh, I like the versatility of their centers. I mean, Hassan Martin for for having mobile yeah. uh, lineup uh, defensive-wise. Onyan Kuzmic when you need big body. Filip Petrushev when you need some um, scoring spark uh, from your bigs. I mean, I think that they did a good job roster-wise building the team compared with the losses they had. Because I thought that when Kalinic left, when Radonjic left, some some other important guys like Hollins, even Nate Walters, I thought that you know these are, um, these losses are too difficult to handle. But the way they rebuilt the team, I mean, I like it. Let, let's just be real. Uh, for a low-budget club, Nikola Kalinic is impossible to replace. Yeah. It is yeah. impossible. They were lucky that he wanted to play at home at least for one season. And and these players, they don't play at low budget teams. Basically, yeah. I mean, it's, he belongs in exceptional. He, he belongs in Barcelona. So, but yeah, I have them a little bit higher. I have them uh, in the 14th. I put them in 12th. Yeah, 12. That's it's gonna be interesting to see if they can win with you know, let's say different. a little bit different style uh -huh. of, of this of basketball. Okay, so, so you, you have you, them 16th. You said your 16th. Panet Naikos. Panet Naikos. Okay. Uh, mm. I mean. I watched them play against Milan, I think. They didn't have impressive preseason so far. I don't like some lineups, uh, for example. I just don't get it why they need Papayanis and Gudaitis as their centers. I mean, for example, Hassan Martin, instead of each, each of them, you know, would make a, way more sense. Uh, there are a lot already. There are some rumors that some players might leave. For example, Andrew Andrews. From what I hear, he might be on the move. Uh, already. Yeah, that's that's the thing about Panthinaikos. I don't like, and I, that's why I don't trust them because they're not consistent as an orga organization. I don't like some some of their uh, roster decisions. Uh, they're still missing. A, uh, okay, they brought Ponitka, but I think that they're yeah. still looking for a forward uh, who could play more as a power forward and maybe a center a backup backup four is is missing on, on on this team yeah and guards i mean i like paris lee and his hustle nate walters was a great fit for radonich and, and cervena zvezda grigonis is gonna shine in a bigger role but just watching them play i just don't feel it's it's a good fit you know generally i i'm in my opinion in my eyes uh most of these players that you've mentioned, they could have a role on many of the Euroleague teams. The problem is that when they're all brought together, together it's not necessarily a very good idea. I, I don't really see an idea behind this team, how the roster was built. They were just signing one player after another, not really thinking too much. And you have Dan Radonic, who we saw was really good in Cervena Zvezda, but when he changed environment and he was working in Germany, in Bayern Munich, he was not very successful. He struggles with English, actually, and now he's going to have so many American players on the roster. I don't believe in them having a very good season, even though I have them in, in the more generous position, let's say. Where do you have them? I rank them in number 13. Okay. Same. Okay. I have 13 them as well and I was smiling when you said uh, you know it seems like another team that was just randomly constructed and I was just thinking about our words about Maccabi uh -huh. and this is what I wrote also you know in, in preparing for this pod is just another team with a lot of you know question marks uh, yeah. in constructing the team and I believe they are going to be great defensively with Nate Walters with Paris Lee with uh, Papayanis with um, you know Guys Derek like Williams Ponitka. with Ponitka with uh, Saint Ru Saint there will Ruse be solid there. defensively. Let's there say. will be solid defensively, but I just don't see how this team work work offensively in my eyes. You don't have enough uh, 
uh, respectable shooters. Yeah. Uh, I can, you know, if I, if I would be the coach, I could choose risking from probably at least two guys on the floor. Least, yeah, if not even more, you know, yeah. at once. So I can just uh, pack the floor for uh, Nate Walters, but pack the floor for Marius Grigonis and uh, limit limit them in that way offensively. So I still them have them 13th. Though. So we kind of lost the plot here, actually. So let's just list what we have so far. Uh, by the way, one more thing to add about Panathinaikos. Uh, it's very interesting. It's going to be interesting to compare Jalgiris and Panathinaikos because basically uh, they kind of, I mean, both Jalgiris and Panathinaikos had the same idea for their backcourt because Jalgiris also wanted uh, to, to, to bring Marius Grigonis. Then Nate Walters was one of the main candidates for the main point guard position, and both guys ended up signing with uh, Panathinaikos. So it's going to be interesting to see which kind of idea of the backcourt will work. Or they might both fail, of course, but mm. it's just interesting to compare for both scouting departments, let's say. And yeah, so I had as well 18th, Jorger 17th, Panathinaikos 16th. And you? Alba 18th as well, 17th, uh, Jalgir is uh, 16th, and Panathinaikos 13th. Yeah, like not skipping any positions, I will go one by one. Uh, 18th is Asvel, 17th is Alba, 16th is Jalgir is 15th and for me. I didn't mention my number 15 is, is Bosconi, actually. Mm -hmm. mm. I'm not surprised at all. One of the, let's say, um, I wouldn't say worst, but quality-wise, yeah, one of the worst rosters I we just can remember about Basconia. Don't have enough info about some of the players they brought, and last season they were kind of disappointing. They were changing coaches. The team was not very clear. I didn't understand what are their strengths, what are they good at. There are some players that I believe should have a good season, but in general. I'm giving them the 15 position, even though I wouldn't be surprised if they finished lower than 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 Jalgiris, for example. Yeah. And usually they change the coach, so this is one of the clubs you might expect to have a different coach before the new year. They're starting with Juan Pen Peñaroya, but we know how Basconia usually deal with losing streaks. So they're my number 15th, and I already mentioned my other p positions. That's 14th Sirvena Zvezda and 13th uh, Panathinaikos. Yeah, and I completely agree with you uh, regarding to Basconia because, I mean, I don't see much quality from the key players and there are so many ifs, for example. Can Dalton Holmes become the next Simone Fontecchio? I really doubt it. I mean, Marcus Howard, is he going to be the next Shane Larkin? We'll see. He has scoring potential, but it's gonna be it's not going to be easy adjustment. Uh, I like Mike Kotsar, for example, big man coming from Estonia. Uh, he had his Euro Cup debut last season with Hamburg. Really hustle, humble, uh, big man. But I mean, Costello, Enoch has to be dominant. But I just don't know. Compared to the other teams, they're just lacking of of talent. Maybe they're gonna click together as a great team. Who knows? We'll see. But I have serious concerns about their potential in the EuroLeague. Darius Thompson, we cannot forget him. Another interesting uh, EuroLeague rookie. He had like 5.5 assists in the preseason, but I just don't know. So we have like five same teams for the last five spots. Just a little bit different different, different order. Different positions, yeah. Uh, so now let's, let's go to which spot? 14th? No, wait. 13th or 12th. We talked about Usually, pro probably twelve if we agree 12, on, on the six, bottom six, five. Six, yeah, last so, six spots. We yeah. talked about Panathinaikos, Basconia, Jalgiris, Zvezda, and we're Asvel, missing Valencia Ronaldo. in this conversation probably. Right? Because, 12, because I have 12. them twelve. Because I have yeah. them twelve, they look to me a more promising team than Basconia. If we compare these two Spanish teams, um, Alex Mumbrú is really considered a very talented uh, young coach, and he has been doing a really good job so far in the ACB league and uh, in now it's time for him to show his his true talent in the EuroLeague and uh, Valencia is known for having the same core of players for many years it's a team known for continuity obviously they lost Mike Toby they had but, some but changes. I think with Boyan Dublevic and Hasiel Rivero they have uh, two good centers that can 
give you dif- different things on the court, like Boyan Dublovich with his experience, ability to play in the post, at the same time shoot the free, and Hasiel Rivero is just a beast going for rebounds and going for all these hustle plays. Um, Chris Jones will be the point guard. Chris Jones, I think it's a very good signing. Uh, what he did uh, with Asphalt, he can easily transfer this to, to the Valencia team, and I believe Alex Mumbro will give him a lot of freedom, and at the same time, he will always have a good scoring guard playing next to him, like Hermanson or Prepelic, and and some other young new players they brought, like Jared Harper and Jonah. Jonah Radibar Radibar was very and, interesting. Yeah, so kid. this is a a team that is really built with a with an idea. This is what I like about them, and, and that's why I'm putting them way higher than than Basconia. And this is why you know Chris Jones being already uh, a Euroleague player for quite some time. Uh, is why one of the reasons why I'm putting uh, Valencia higher than Basconia, because they will have Marcus Howard. You know, maybe his upside and potential is bigger, mm. but that is going to be his first season after barely playing in the NBA and dominating in, in NCAA. So, and Chris Jones already has spent two seasons uh, in the Euroleague playing big, let's say, big roles. So, yeah, this is a big advantage for Valencia. So who's your number 12? Uh, as I said, my number 12 was Cervena Zvezda, number 13, Alba, and I had Valencia's oh. 14th, Valencia Basconia 15th. 15th. Okay, okay. Basically, it's just because of the same same reasons you mentioned, so there's no need to expand even more. Yeah, so number 11. Maccabi Tel Aviv? No? I'm thinking about it, and... Yeah, I have. They Maccabi. have potential to make the playoffs. Yes, they do. But I see more potential to fail. Because Ever since the they signed Wade Baldwin, it it looked like it it's a possible car crash. I mean, yeah, the, somewhere the bomb they don't is have a strong already. coach first of all, and when they signed Lorenzo Brown, it looked like he's going to be the main point guard, the main ball handler. He he should play the role like in the Sp- Spanish national team, and it could be okay because some other players that they brought are interesting, like Darren Hilliard after a good season with Bayern Munich, Bonzi Colson, um, Josh but Nebo a, as that, a center. The problem. Yeah, but they're smart scorers. Like, I don't think for Darren Healer there's a big problem to play next to Lorenzo Brown and, and have mm. the ball in his hands a little less than he did in Bayern. But the problem is Wade Baldwin. I don't re- really understand how they're going to fit these players together, knowing Wade Baldwin and his ego and, and the way he sees basketball. I, I don't think it's a good decision to to bring him next to Lorenzo Brown, Darren Hillard, and all these other players. And then the other problem is, like I said, I I don't think Odette Katash is a very strong coach. And and again, this is one of the clubs that I could see changing their head coach during the season. And actually putting them as number 11 is rather generous when we left yeah. behind teams that probably will have better chemistry yeah. and probably will play smarter basketball. But also knowing the talent of these individuals, mm. who knows? Maybe something will magically click and Maccabi will go for, for for the playoffs. For me, it's like something like, is either really good or is either extremely bad? There is... No middle and extremely team. bad would be for them not making the playoffs. I mean, with this kind of roster, you would expect at least uh, fighting for them for the seventh or eighth spot, although I, I don't see Maccabi there. Uh, 11 new players, you know, the oh. rebuild re- the rebuild of every summer continues. But if they s- somehow click, could do you guys think they could become like something like a Unix did what did uh, last year? You know, They could. We didn't really they see could. the fit of Unix last season, but uh, yeah. they started demonstrating really great basketball. Uh, Lorenzo Brown was also there, and uh, I don't see them clicking. It's but a nice comparison, actually. But um, they had these knows? rebounders at their front line, and they had these, let's say, players with big, with big egos. We thought that they're gonna, you know, clash somewhere in the locker room. But Mario Hezonia, Lorenzo Brown, other guys like Isaiah Cannon, they fit very well together. Here is like, you know, Darren Hillard and Isaiah Cannon. You can find the comparison. Wade Baldwin, Mario Hezonia, uh, Tony Jakiri, and Josh Nebo or Alex Poitras. Of course, they're gonna miss John Brown type of player. Uh, mm. They, I just in general, I think they're they're gonna miss players who will accept their role and being, let's say, helpers, uh, glue guys, starting from from defense. 
I'm just not sure how they're gonna uh, share the ball. Well, honestly, share the I, I would make one roster change, and that might be enough. I wouldn't spend money on Wade Baldwin. Maybe I'm being too disrespectful towards him, but <laughs> just don't sign him. No, it's either between you know, if you sign Lorenzo Brown, then you don't sign Wade Baldwin, yeah. or vice versa. That's simple. And invest money to a stretch four, like uh, someone like Alec Peters, for example, who signed with Olympiacos. That's it. That's the only roster change, yeah, and I, I agree. I, I would be happy with, with the team that I have. I, I would just switch somebody from you know Josh Nebo and Alex Poitras. I just think that they're just they're same. Yeah, but it's players. okay if your your idea is based on switching centers. It's okay. You, I mean, gonna, they're going to be doing that Obviously, a lot. was a big paint presence, but it's not that easy to replace a player like Ante Zizic because he's one of the best centers playing back to the basket. So I'm I'm okay with that. They're going the American way. That's that's the Maccabi w- approach. I, I'm okay with I'm that. I'm just thinking that as the coach, you want to have as more different tools as you can have for different type of situations. So just that's no, why. But, but Messina comes, is, is, is more than fine signing Heinz and, and <laughs> Davis, and he doesn't have well, a problem. I mean, with Davis that. offensively, he's he's way more skilled than Poitras or Nibo yeah, combined. That's for sure. But that's for sure. But yeah, a lot of comes from the head coach and his system and his strategy. And there's uh, Odette Kataj is players coach. He's known for really short practices. American players like him because he's not putting a lot of uh, offensive, uh, defensive systems, uh, a lot of sets uh, on their heads to make the game difficult. He likes uh, his players to improvise more and play from their talent but at the same time when it takes when we're talking about Wade Bolvin he's the player who needs a challenge from his coach uh, it's, it's very hard to explain his personality he's tough but at the same time if he matches some very tough but at the same time a smart coach like for example Andrea Trinkieri was there there's a reason why they kind of clicked good together when they were in Bayern Munich and they made it to, uh, to the top eight. So he needs uh, somebody on the sidelines to control him, to challenge him and, you know, to help him to to move forward. So how it goes with Odette Katash, um, I really don't know. I have some serious concerns about that as well. You no, know, so, Bolden was the number one option in Bayern as well. The green yeah. light in every possession. Uh, the offense that was... You, know, you just don't see him being him. very effective playing off ball. He needs the ball in his yeah. hands. But so does Lorenzo. Mm-hmm. And I mean, the only person who might get an idea for what is going on is probably David Blatt because he was the first who believed in Wade Baldwin when he invited in Olympiacos in his first EuroLeague season. The problem was that Blatt was fired after the first game of the EuroLeague season, so Baldwin also had a very bad season uh, there in, in Greece. So maybe he has an idea because he was involved in, in roster building, but I don't know. Okay, number 11. Yeah, let's Maccabi. go with top so 10. top 10 right now. Basically, we're talking about teams that will be in contention for the playoffs. Yeah, I have yeah. these three teams, 9, 10, and, and, and Maccabi, uh, yeah. fighting for the playoffs. So my number 10 would be Partizan, Belgrade. Okay. It's great to have Jelko Bradovic back in the EuroLeague where he belongs. Be fun to watch. Obviously, this team is a mix of experience and youth, and the experience that they have in American players is more than respectable, let's say. James Nunnally... Um, Kevin Punter, Zach Lide, you cannot go wrong with the, these names. Um, also, Dante Exum, that was a huge signing, I think. I didn't expect him to stay in Europe. Mm. N- he was clear about trying yeah. to get another shot in the NBA. And now he, he signed with Partizan. Not, it's not like he, he stayed with Barcelona or, or moved to Madrid. He, he signed with a team that's getting back to the EuroLeague and has a lot of ambition, obviously, and also additions of Andusic, Papa Petru. It's a good roster where, where you see some young, promising players and at the same time proven veterans. So number 10 and a possibility to fight for the playoffs, that, that's my prediction for Partizan. I have, it, mm-hmm. yeah. I have them at nine, ninth, actually. And uh, do you think Dan Texum is a starting point guard in this team? That's I don't think question. he should play point guard on any team, honestly. But if that's the idea they have, why not? 
Because I see Nunnally and Papa Petro at the three, Kevin Punter and Danilo and Usage at the two. Yeah, but you know what? If, have... if Exum is is the point guard, Punter will have the ball in his hands most of the time, anyways. Oh, yeah. Because he's their main scorer. I didn't see them playing yet in their preseason. Yeah. They had eight games, uh, and of course, they didn't play their full roster, but. From the stats, I saw that Yam Madar was dishing like 5.3 assists per game. Uh, he was playing for 26 minutes per game. Dante Exum was like playing 20 minutes, 8.4 points and 2 assists. So I would say that probably the primary idea is to have Yam Madar as their main point guard. Maybe it's, you know, let's say do or die season for Yamadar at the EuroLeague level under coach Obradovic because there were a lot of there were high expectations uh, around him before his rookie experience with Jelko Obradovic I would say he wasn't solid enough for this team and probably that's the huge reason why they didn't manage to win the ABBA league or go uh, further in the Euro Cup so maybe they will just give him another shot at it. Of course, he's more matured. He knows the system better and it might be an advantage. But if that project fails or he won't be consistent, I think, of course, Dante Exum might be uh, another ball handler who could uh, take the all the, let's say, lead of the team over. I just, I really like Partizan uh, because what's, what's also interesting, when Obradovic turn, uh, to, took over the team, uh, I remember talking to their GM, Zoran Savic, and he said that basically he wanted all 12 young players on his roster, just just like in all these old times of partisan era when they had a lot of young players, few local veterans, and maybe two import players making a difference. So at some situations, Zoran Savic had to convince him to sign more solid, more proven players. And they, they had a, a lot of, probably too many young players last year. And in my eyes, they lacked of depth, experience, and solid leadership starting from the point guard position because I didn't like the fit between Yamadar and Dallas move, Moore. But this offseason, they didn't sign a single young player. They signed James Nunnally, uh, Papa Petro, Dante Exum, they kept Matthias Lazort, and as you mentioned, there's Lide, Punter. I mean, they really load the team, uh, I would say. So you're thinking about the playoffs? Yeah, I put them even higher than Virtus Bologna. No, I, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. They're my number 10 and my number 9, out of respect to the Andrea. great coach Andrea Dinkieri is yeah. Bayern Munich. It seems like it doesn't really matter what roster they have. Yeah. As long as Trinkieri is there, they're going to be close to the top eight or they might even make it to the top eight as they did in the The past eighth two spot seasons. is locked for Bayern Munich. Yeah, I mean, I know that last season they had some luck because, because the Russian teams were disqualified from the competition, but still, you cannot take it away from them. They made it to the playoffs, even with all the injuries they had. So I, I don't have too much to say about the roster. I'm just trusting the genius Trust the process. In, in Andrea Trinchieri. That's it. Uh, they're going to have, I mean, mystery of the season for me. Bayern Munich Min- team. Uh, no, the, the team as a whole. But I oh, think yeah, yeah. Cassius Winston is going to be the guy to watch. Yeah. Um, the guy maybe is not athletic, athletically ready for the NBA. Not that type of level of athleticism. But for Europe... He's he's really solid, great shooter off the dribble, mm, great hesitation moves. So he's going to be a beast in ISO situations or coming off the dribble and pick and rolls. And uh, you know he scored thirty one and thirty two. Thirty two. Yeah. Okay. In one, uh, in pre- game. Preseason game. Yeah. So um, the whole team, the other new signings are kind of a mystery. But um, if this guy, uh, let's say plays how he's supposed to play, how they, how Bayern Munich believes uh, his level is. Um, I believe they can... I don't see them making the playoffs still, but uh, I have them at, at number 10. So, and let's say from these three teams, Partizan, Maccabi, and Bayern Munich, if I had to choose one team who is most likely to get into the top eight, I would say Bayern. Okay. Where do you rank Bayern? I have them as my 10th seed. And your ninth? Uh, just just few few more words about Bayern. I mean, um, I like it's one of these rare examples where you can 
where you have basically a role player who develops in year two, in year three at the same organization and becomes a solid one of the cornerstone players for the team. I'm talking about Nick Weiler Bab, and we remember his journey. Then we we see these uh, up and coming players, Obst or Yarmas, for example, uh, Jean Shishko. I mean, it's it, when you watch him play, when you think about him, it's incredible to think uh, to know that he's only 25 years old, although he plays like 34 year old veteran in a good way. I mean reading the game so smart and being such a high IQ player. So I just like this organization in terms of how they develop players, how they're patient with their players, because usually teams like Panathinaikos or others, especially talking about the foreigner players, they're just mm, changing them every every season. So let's see which of these other players will develop who stayed with Andrea for, for, for a longer time. And of course, yeah, there are X-factors like Cassius uh, Winston. And there's this amazing, you know, thing about Trinquiere because just if you take Trinquiere out of this team, probably we would rank them as, I don't know, 13, 14 seed? Way lower. Sincerely. Lower. Yeah, exactly. I think somewhere, yeah. somewhere behind Jalgiris. Somewhere, yeah, somewhere close, close to Jalgiris. So it's just imp- incredible the impact, uh, what kind of impact he makes. But the, the other interesting thing is that uh, we're talking about Bayern Munich being a Euroleague playoff contender. Mm-hmm. However, in in the Bundesliga, Alba has a free beat. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, usually they always their goal, at least Bayern's goal, was always international competition. They didn't have. Uh, deep selection of local players, but now yeah. th- th- it will be a different story because Nick Weiler Bab he got the German passport, and they brought somebody else. I think. Uh, oh, of course, Isaac Bonga. Bonga. We cannot yeah. forget Isaac, Isaac Bonga. Bonga. Yeah. Yeah. Should, Another interesting X factor. Should be a big defensive presence, actually. Yeah, and he can play basically all the positions. Uh, another interesting guy on this roster. Yeah. So, so you're number nine. Virtus Bologna. I Wait, had where th- do you have Bayern then? 10th. Mm. Yeah. I was choosing between partisan, partisan and then. Virtus. And oh, I took Partizan okay. because uh, I believe in Jelkup, Jelko's process because he built a completely new team. Uh, it took a lot of time for him as usual in his previous projects. If you remember Fenerbahce, probably even the first year in Panaikos, I might be wrong, but uh, he was usually when he was rebuilding the team, from the scratch, I mean, that team in, in this season, they didn't even make the top eight, for mm-hmm. example, although they had star uh, players. Uh, so I believe that he kept the same core, he added more experience, uh, more more quality, and now they're going to be uh, just a better team in general. They, they will have this huge fan support. They already sold like 10,000 season ticket, tickets. And when I look at Virtus, I don't know. I'm just. They're also deep. They're super well coach, uh, coach. But I just don't like that there are so many veterans on that team. Uh, I just don't like the fact that uh, they're also a new team. They build a new project. But at the middle and the end of the season last year, they had Daniel Hackett and Tornika Schenkelia, who once again changes the whole uh, concept uh, of the mm-hmm. team. Sergio Scariola was trying to build. Schengeli uh, is out uh, again uh, due to injury. There are more veterans, uh, more injuries uh, for the start of the season. So I don't think that throughout the season they will manage. Okay, I'm not saying they will, won't make the playoffs. They could easily make the playoffs because the margin between the ninth or eighth seed is just you know ridiculously ridiculously small. But if if there is a conversation who would make the playoffs, I, I just think that Partizan has more advantages and basically starts from the continuity of the team. I have Virtus Bologna at eight. Me too. Uh, I, I put them ahead of Partizan, ahead of Bayern, obviously. I mean, it's just crazy to think uh, how many different options they have at, at the guard positions. It's the deepest uh, backwards in probably in the Euroleague. You have Milos. You know, maybe, maybe Real Madrid can offer maybe something. Maybe if they add Campasso, then yeah. But right now, still, Jan and Musa is their main point guard, actually, point forward. But looking at this roster, when you have Milos Teodosic, Daniel Hackett, Ife Lundberg, 
Nico Mannion, if he if he gets back in shape, and uh, also Marco Bellinelli and Alessandro Paiola, you have so many different options at the one and two positions, and also Sammy Ojale moving up. In. You see Sammy Ojale. I, I think he's going to be a very exciting Euroleague player. I'm looking forward to seeing him. Um, you have Kyle Weems. You have Doko Shengelia, who will be back eventually. Mam Jaite is a dominant center, and then you have a Jordan Mickey as as your backup, who can also play in, in the Four. fourth position while Toko is injured. So I think this is this roster is stacked really, and I couldn't put them lower than than number eight. Yeah, I have them. I have them in the playoffs simply because of the one of the deepest rosters in the in the whole Euroleague, and uh, I'm. Just wondering what their you know spacing in the front court are going to look like when Shengelia gets back. Yeah, you know with the, this kind of backcourt, you want at least one of two of your big guys that can shoot the ball very well. We all know Shengelia has his you know uh, advantages on the offense, but um, that is Jordan Mickey. Jordan Mickey, you know, do you want to risk with him like? I would not mind uh, doing that, you know, defensively. Uh, but um, I could even see them as in in number seven, to to be honest. I could see them go much even higher than number yeah. eight. But this is a power ranking, and yeah. in, in the power ranking, you have to you have to just try to see what's going to happen in the future. Yeah. And yeah, so so let me guess. You guys have uh, Fenerbahce, Istanbul at number seven. No, I have not, not really. I have my favorite no? team. Yeah, I have my favorite Ooh, team. Monaco. I have Monaco way higher. I want to see their potential them way is like they have potential to be a Final Four team. I want to see them way higher. I want to see them going back to the playoffs and maybe even to the Final Four. I, I will be cheering for them this whole season. Like I said, they're going to be my favorite team to watch. To watch, and also I, I kind of support them. <laughs> Because of reasons. Let's just be honest. <laughs> because of reasons. No, so no, no, wait, wait. Reason. Yeah. There, there aren't two. Yeah. There's, there's one. <laughs> and we all yeah. know who it is. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you're right. But, you know, look, the talent is is just crazy. Mike James and, and Jordan Lloyd playing together and also having the help of, of young, talented French player, Elio Kobo, a left-handed shooting guard. And... John Brown is such an amazing signing in my eyes. Also, they kept some of the players that that, that were good last season, like Dante Hall and Alpha Diallo. Diallo yeah. And what I like is that they brought good French players because last season they had basically French players that were there taking the local player spot, mainly for the French league, but they didn't really help much in the EuroLeague. Right now you can expect a lot of help from Adrian Mormon and, and Elio Cobo. So this is a good roster. Who knows? Maybe they will add to it during this season, like they did last mm. year. We'll see because right now there are only twelve players uh, on the roster. But come on, man! They I, have everything. They have everything. They, they, have. They, they must be in the playoffs. Like last season, Monaco making the playoffs was kind of an upset. They changed the coach. They signed Sasha Bradovic. They they had some difficulties during the season. They had some chemistry issues. Right now, you're really expecting them to make the playoffs, and they should be there. They belong in the top eight. Uh, I put them in number seven, but like like I said, I want to see them way higher. And you have them. I way have higher. them fifth, actually. Fifth. That's nice. Yeah. And it's it would be you know it may sound strange, but you could have a great defensive team with Mike James. In it, Ooh. and uh, I mean, it's obvious. You know, you have to take uh, some energy off when you are such yeah. a when you have such a high usage offensively. But to, if you if you have him and you have uh, Dante Hall, John Brown, and Alpha Diallo next next to you, and let's say Jordan Okobo and Elio uh, Jordan uh, Lloyd and Elio Okobo are on the bench for some reason, and you put in Otara there as well. Who is going to score, you know, on this team? I believe uh, Donatas Motiunas is going to play even less minutes than than last year because John Brown might play some minutes at the five, and they're going to switch uh, all. Um, 
but one thing uh, about them, I see them as fifth, but I don't see them. I mean, even if Mike James, every, any, anything is possible in a playoff series, but I think uh, missing Dwayne Bacon, you know, the secondary scorer, uh, who is a tall guy who can post up, you know, let's say from high post, just he, uh, how he did in the playoff series. I think it's um, uh, a huge lu luxury to have in a playoff series. And having two great scorers on the perimeter is not going to replicate what he brought to the team yeah. in the playoff series. So uh, I'm not ruling them from being in the final four, but I think looking in really, really uh, long future that missing Dwayne Bacon in a playoff series are going to be huge for this team. And who knows, maybe Dwayne Bacon will be back. Uh, before the new year if his los angeles lakers tryouts yeah. do to not be honest work i hope out. not I hope <laughs> not we'll because but yeah. you know john Wait, brown he signed today but it's a non-guaranteed like yes for yes. the training oh, camp okay, deal okay. yeah but it's a huge thing that they managed to replace a veteran player like will thomas by upgrading in that position because john brown is an upgrade and also we have adrian mormon a very experienced power forward so i i, I just I'm just very excited to see Monaco starting the season and I will be probably watching all of their games. <laughs> yeah, Bacon would add them a lot, but you know, at the same time, it's so not for you, they're also 2K. number seven, right? Yeah, number and, seven, and just as for me. Okay. So, who's your number seven? Fenerbahce. Fenerbahce, right? It's really hard to predict their season for me. Yeah, I don't know. Only one starter remain in that team. I think their offense is going to be extremely fun to watch with. Kalaitis with Bielitsa at the four, with Wilbekin, Wilbekin uh, with Carson Edwards. Edwards, who is going, who is uh, you know, John Motley. I mean, Jonathan Motley. It's going to be a, fun, a really fun team to watch uh, offensively. But um, I'm predicting a seventh place, but just simply because of how these individual players, uh, you know, let's say, I how I imagine them in my eyes, and if someone could be, you know, the genius behind all of these new players coming in. It's you have the perfect coach to fit them all. Yeah, I, I have them at, at number six. I Me think too. I think first of all it's a team built from scratch. It's not an easy thing to do to build a completely new team because we yeah. were so used to watching Vesely and the Colo playing the pick and roll. And now all of a sudden you're gonna have to adjust to new faces. Well, Nicolaitis will be running the show. I think for Nicolaitis, this will be a much better environment than Barcelona. He will have plenty of shooters around him. Um, even some of the bigs are, are, are capable of shooting, like Devin Booker is. And Nemanja Bielica is such an underrated comeback to the EuroLeague. He's coming back as an NBA champion. He's a proven player. I think he, he still has a lot of basketball left in him, even, even though he's aging. So... They're number six, but at the same, in my eyes, but at the same time, they're a legit Final Four contender, I believe. With with Coach Etudis and uh, all these experienced star players, as you could say, who knows what will happen. But it's not going to be easy because this is a very a completely new team, and the head coach has been uh, with with the Greek national team, and some of the players were also playing in the international competition, so th they might have a tough start, I think. But or you know what, ups and downs throughout the season. Maybe who knows? I, yeah. I'm predicting a tough start, but I think they, mm -hmm. they they should peak somewhere in the middle of the season, and and we will definitely see Fenerbahce in the playoffs. Among the top eight teams, they probably face the biggest rebuild, uh, starting from the coaching staff down to the key players. But what's good that all the new guys they quickly adjusted uh, to their roles. For example, there are stats from six friendly games, and John Motley was averaging 18 points and 5.5 uh, rebounds. Uh, Carson Edwards, 17.7 uh, point, points. Wilbekin, 14 points. I mean, that's that's promising. That's a very promising team. And as you mentioned, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised watching them making the Final Four. I can say the same about Monaco. And it makes this year league so exciting because we have at least seven teams. Um, legit contenders. Legit Final Four contenders. So... Fenerbahce for you is There's also, also six number seed. six, right? So we move to number five. You you said Monaco. I had six uh, Olympiacos. Olympiacos. Oh yes, oh. Olympiacos. They remain. They you know they stayed solid. They are probably 
one of the teams that changed the least, let's say from the core rotation players, uh, they will keep winning at home. They will play beautiful basketball with a lot of passes, with a lot of movement. Should be really good at the start of the season because you know you have your core playing together for the second straight season. Uh, they switched to Tyler Dorsey with Isaiah Cannon, but I just don't see them, you know, making the jump to become a contender for the title because you know last season you go to the final four so the next step from the team standpoint you you can expect okay we are going to try to win the title but uh i don't see them making the necessary steps to to become you know one of the it's just that teams above are so stacked mm. Uh, that I just don't see them winning. But uh, I, I don't see them winning also, but th that's not their issue in my eyes. The issue is that other teams got stronger. And they yeah, already overachieved the last year. Real Madrid got stronger, Milan got stronger, uh, even Efes got stronger. Even Efes got stronger. So I, I love that they replaced uh, the legend Yorgos Printezis with Alec Peters because you need a stretch for a power forward who can shoot the yeah. ball. And now you will have Vizenkov and Peters. I can easily see them playing in the same lineup. For example, Vizenkov having some minutes as a number three. I don't, I don't think that should be a problem if needed. Also, Joel Bolombo is there as your as your backup center. Tariq Black, uh, they have a proper bench, and it gives Coach Barsokas uh, a lot of opportunities to to play different lineups. Obviously, you're going to be dependent on on Costas Lucas and and his pick and rolls, Thomas Walkup, and his defense, Shaquille McKissick and his energy. Uh, and Isaiah Cannon replacing Tyler Dorsey, it's an interesting move. We'll see how it works out. I think Dorsey is much better defensively, but uh, Cannon's in, in a terms of version of uh... in terms of shooting, when Cannon gets hot, he can easily put 20 points on the stat sheet. So I just think that Dorsey is a bit more versatile offensive player because Cannon, we used to see him just shooting the ball, coming off the screens. Dorsey can draw some fouls, uh, fouls. He can play pick and roll more as what he did actually last year in Olympiacos compared to, to Isaiah Cannon and yeah, his role Cannon in Cannon is all about shooting. He's an undersized shooting guard, you could say, because uh, looking at his size, he should be the point guard, but he will not be the point guard because Costas Lucas is there or so Thomas so Walker yeah. organizing the the offense. But again, when you have a team that made it to the final four and only needed to change a couple of players and not necessarily key players, you can easily go for them uh, repeating the success or at least being in 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 a playoff series. So they're my number five. Yeah, I I like their frontline moves. Uh, as I mentioned, Alec Peters is amazing replacement for Yorgos Printezis is a 40% three-point shooter. Even Joel Bolomboy, he can stretch the floor and probably does the biggest difference compared to Hassan Martin. I don't like when Bolomboy tries no, of course, to stretch the But floor, at least but he creates <laughs> okay, some <man. laughs> threat offensively and, and in some way he stretches the floor and kind of confuses the uh, defensive uh, players. So they were one of the worst three-point shooting teams uh, last season. They were 13th in the regular season. Uh, so Are they number five for you as well? Yeah, they're number yeah, five for me I, as well. I thought so that the big four uh, will be the same for just, all just of us. The biggest question, you know, of repeating the success is, of course, the other teams getting stronger and Isaiah Cannon, can he step up? He he didn't have a solid um, preseason so far, averaging only 7.3 points uh, per game. As I mentioned, I think he's not as versatile offensive but player like Dorsey Cannon, was. Man. He will go one from nine... One night and the other night he will seven go from five ten. from seven, yeah, or seven from ten. Yeah, that, that, but that's you who know, he is. that that's the difference that might you know um, get them uh, between the final four and the playoffs. So the the biggest thing is that even though he's not hitting shots yet, Barzokas fully trusts him. There are no concerns about him. He really likes this fit and the idea of of, of this team. So we'll see okay, how so far the, they will go me, let's let's, let's uh, last last thing yeah. about olympiakos is that the question for me and i'm probably going to trigger a lot of uh, Oli fans right now but was their last season success related to the removal of the three teams you know this is this is the question for me uh i know they played really great basketball but um i think and this is why i don't see them in the final four this year you know, uh, yeah I, I can see your part point of it of course i can see your point you cannot deny it also i must say that my highlight of last season was uh, Olympiacos Monaco oh, series. Yeah, for sure. That was the amazing highlight of the season, not the final four, the series. 
Yeah, and let's move to the big four. Let's see how we rank the big four. I, I want to see uh, what you have at four. I have Barcelona. Same. I have Barcelona, first of all, because Mirotic is out, and we don't know how long he's going to be out. Completely agree. I saw them in the Supercopa, and, and Sharas plays with Shanley and Toby, and on defense, it's not going to work. Offensively, fine. Yeah. They can both score. They can score from the outside. We saw in the El Clasico, Shanley scoring like first 11 points for Barcelona. But defensively, I don't see that working and I don't really like Toby and Shanley in the same lineup, honestly. Vesely is a good signing. You could, I'm, I'm, I'm really calm about him doing his things in Barcelona. And Satoransky, like we're seeing from the first games, he is just not that good as Nicolaitis was. Even though he will have his assists and everything, uh, yeah, Jokubaitis probably has improved and has developed and will be even better. But right now, when Corey Higgins also is out, not only Miritic, again, Barca is dependent on Nico Laprovitola. So I, I have them at number four. And the funny thing is, I don't think they will be good defensively. I mean, hmm. Kalinic is a glue guy. He, he does a lot. And Vesely... He can switch, he can do a lot of things defensively as well, but you're going to be playing a lot of minutes with Shanley and Toby. And Mirotic will be out until... But Mirotic was a hole in defense as well. Yeah, but so. Mirotic compensates <laughs> yeah, completely. on the other side of the court. On the other side, and Toby doesn't, in my eyes. I mean, right now, me Toby is the guy that has to be, um, has to cover Mirotic minutes. And for me, they are the team to follow early in the season. I want to see, you know, many new faces... And Nico's injury just completely changes the face of this team for me. And how will they find their group? Groove. Uh, what lineups are they going to play? Especially at the four and five, there is Oscar da Silva there as well. Yeah, he didn't Who, play in the Super Cup. He didn't play. But um, what kind of front court are Shares going to choose to start the games? To you know, play defense against uh, some particular opponents? Um, it's just so many question marks and what's going to work, what's not. So uh, it's just for me, Barca is not, you know, the most fun team to watch, uh, but the most interesting team to watch for these kind of reasons, because it's just so many question marks around that team. They're not fun team to watch, but I think it's one of the most consistent teams. And last year they had a lot of injury problems with Nicolaitis, Corey Higgins. I think that they both missed more than 10 games uh, each. And even now with Nic Nicola, uh, without Mirotic, I still see them uh, winning. I think it's too early to judge Thomas Satransky. He's coming after uh, Eurobasket experience I'm not where judging he played you. through injury. I'm just injury. saying that Kalaitis is, is a better point guard. Could be, but maybe Sharas needed a little bit different player, uh, also different mentality player. Maybe Kalaitis and Desikavich just wasn't, get, wasn't getting along uh, um, as good, you know, for a long run, uh, for a long uh, big team success. I just think that even though they have uh, these, this big problem with Mirotic, I think they will be very consistent throughout the regular season. I That's mean, even if they finish fourth, as long as you have the home court advantage, it's not like you, you cannot win the yeah. EuroLeague. Um, we're talking about the no, big four. And we're I'm just, just building up, uh, putting them in third seed third, in, yeah. my, in, in my oh, ranking. Okay. Because, as I said, there's consistency. This team, um, they feel joy playing with each other so far, even with late Satransk and Vesely additions. They're both smart players. They adjusted really quickly. Uh, they enjoy, everybody enjoys uh, playing together. Of course, Mike Tobley, <laughs> Mike Tobey is not the best replacement for, for Nikola Mirotic, but as I said, Sharas knows how to hide some things. And one of the main question marks, of course, is Corey Higgins, uh, how healthy and he is, how long he will be out. But I think that in the long run, and at least in the re regular season, they will be fine uh, you know for what, the third seed. Another thing I want to say, like... Uh, Obviously, they played against uh, a very specific player, Eddie Tavares, uh, but and Enya Busele, but uh, I don't think they will be a very good rebounding team. Also, yeah, Jan Vesely is is great, but again, if you're playing with Shanley and Toby, I don't think they will be physical and 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 good enough rebounding the ball, and they might suffer from opponents getting those second chances again yes Eddie Tavares is, is a different beast but that's just my general view and you know maybe they are not going to play with this duo maybe uh, I, I'm just know. talking from what I saw yeah, in the in the, the Super Copa uh, maybe it was some sort of an experiment to check some some ideas how, how that might work on the court 
But against Madrid also, they got in, in, in foul trouble, these bigs. I mean, Shanley, Vesely, they were in the foul trouble. So Toby ended up playing at the fifth position. And, you know, it's, it's crazy for me to believe that Nicola Provitola is now the star player of an elite Euroleague team because he is the guy who has to decide the end of the ending of the game. He will have the ball in his hands in crucial possessions. As uh, long as Higgins is out. As long yeah. as Higgins yeah. is out. So this is the case right now. And that's another argument why I see them as number four lower than these other big four teams because these other teams starting the season don't have that many question marks and they don't have their key player injured. Yeah. Like imagine if FS starts season with Mitic being out for four or five months. They start season with Larkin missing two months. Okay, m maybe a month. A better comparison might would be Mitic, mm. or or for uh, for Milan. Let's say they they signed Pangos and, and he will be missing. out for half mm. the half of the season. That changes everything. And Mirotic is a top three Euroleague player. Let's not forget that. Yeah, but even playing without Mirotic and Higgins, they were about to win the Supercopa. And if not that crazy so, third quarter run and Sergio Yui making crazy shots, I mean... Well, it's not that Real Madrid played great, but in the end they won it. Just last thing about Barcelona, you know, I said they're not a fun team to watch, fun team to watch because of how they play, but they're one of the most interesting teams because of Charas. And if there is one coach that can uh, hide all these problems and... Uh, uh, expose other team weakness, other teams' weaknesses in the regular season. It's him, you know. He's the game plan master for me in the Euroleague, and this is why they can win a lot more games uh, than, let's say, they're supposed to because of all these injuries, because of, because all of these question marks. So, uh, as long as they're fourth, as long as they make the final four, and Miritich is back in his uh, at one hundred percent, they are they are contenders to win. Yeah. So, so your number free. four? No, he didn't say my number, number four, four is another FS. Basically, because it's FS, the of course the biggest change is that finally they will have some guys wait, wait, who will be motivated enough to boost this team. I are mean, you are you predicting are you, their position or are you doing a power ranking? Or is it just the regular season? Regular season power ranking. We're oh, not talking okay, about the okay, and okay. you know we're not then predicting who will then win I the yearly see, right? I can see that. Yeah, ah, because I thought that we we're you know power ranking the it's regular up to you. season. It's no, up to you. it's just yeah, a regular so season power ranking because when it you know when it takes the final four, we're talking about two games. We're talking about yeah. injuries. You cannot predict seven months uh, away. No, but from you the know the, the thing is that uh, if it's a power ranking, then you're literally ranking the power of the teams. If if it's a prediction where you're predicting the position, then I could also see F as being no, third or fourth. No, I mean of course F S is. Probably the most talented talented team in the Euroleague, but it's FS. They will probably start playing <laughs> basketball since January. Uh, they will lose some games. We have Shane Larkin out. I mean, that's Mince a great point. is always uh, injured. He has some injury problems. But the only difference which will keep them in the top four in the regular season is that they have Will Clyburn, they have Ante Zizic, uh, some new players, some very solid new players who will boost them through these moments mm. where they won't feel focused enough on winning, especially early uh, into the season. Mm. So I just see them dropping some games. I see them, let's say, having some injuries and that might affect their, their final position in the regular season. So, so that's yeah. yeah that's that's I mean I agree that's with fair you. Point. If, that's so true. If I have to predict uh, the position I will also say that they're third or fourth but in the power rankings they're my number 1 because I'm I'm ranking the general ability of the team to dominate others and since they added Will Clyburn I I couldn't put them lower than number 1 and Ante Zizic as well I mean yeah, yeah Will Clyburn is the adding probably of the summer. Polonara also. Polonara as yeah. well, yeah. I mean, defense at the power forward position might be a question mark, you know, with him and a math M by A, but, but it's just the lineups that this team can offer, uh, the shooting that they have, yeah. the star power, the ability to create shots, you know, with Mitch Larkin and Clyburn at the same time on the court. Mm. Do you also have it's them at number one? Yeah, yeah, I have them power ranking number one. So who do you have as your top three? My third place is Real Madrid. Oh, I have uh, Olympia Milano. I had some debate with myself, which one do I prefer? And I, I put Madrid at number three 
first of all, because I'm not so sure if Chus Mateo will be as good at man managing as Pablo Lasso was, especially knowing that now mm -hmm. there's Mario Hezonia on the team. And they have a deeper roster. They have a deeper roster and than last season. I don't know how Hezonia is gonna fit there, honestly. From watching the Super Copa, it was really strange to see Hezonia playing sporadic minutes, struggling on the court, and in the end, watching the fourth quarter from the bench, because it seems like Janan Musa is, is going to flourish in this team. He's going to play as the point forward. The confidence is through the roof. Yeah, he's he's a great player, and it's it's great to see him finally in, in, in an elite team with a huge role, and he, he's going to be one of the most important players for them, even though the numbers will come from Tavares, Yabusele, some things don't really change. Deck. Gabi Deck also playing his post-ups from the third position. Uh, yeah, Chacho Rodriguez and Sergio Yu, they're, they're now veterans. They don't have that high expectations like they did seven or eight years ago, but you can depend on them in some games. They can games. still win you games. Yeah. So uh, playing out of crucial minutes in yeah. the Supercopa. So Crazy. The, everything is is good with Madrid. They have yeah. a very deep roster as usually. Yeah. It's, just, Musa it's just that I'm not so quickly. sure if if Chus Mateo will be that good at man management management because we know how Madrid approached the regular season in both ACB and Euroleague. It's all about the rotation. You play 20 minutes on Thursday, then you're gonna play 10 minutes on Sunday. Is Mario Hezonia going to be okay with that, and will he? Hey, damage the they have a Sergio bit. Yui, Rudy Fernandez, and Chacha, you know, to take care of Mario Hezonia. He's, he's going to be that badass, which might threaten the general, you know, wellness of the team. He will be I don't know, team. man. I don't know. It's Mario Hezonia we're talking about. Yeah, but you can make some quick moves. It's Real Madrid. It's the team which they lost how many? 100 millions over the last four years or something. I mean, if they see him as a threat at some way, they will easily cut him from the team. And they have enough leadership. Shout out to Thomas Huerta. Veteran players <laughs> with Chacho, Rudy, Yui, and Cozer, I mean, just to, to control uh, him. I mean, honestly, if, if they somehow add Facundo Campazzo to this picture, I, I will rank them at number two or, or number one. But right now they're number three in my eyes. I remember we had this podcast and we, we talked about man management already in August, about just Matteo, biggest question, let's say. Yeah. And... Uh, Simply, you know, they're my number two as well. Uh, you had them at third, right? Yes. I have them at second because they addressed their last season issues, which was the star power in the backcourt, and you have dominant centers, you have Yabuzele to four, you have Gabi Deck. You are, uh, you know, safe with injuries getting in your way because you just have such a deep roster in first three positions. So... Um, I'm betting on Real Madrid winning uh, the regular season in the EuroLeague. Yeah, I could see that happening. Again, it's a power ranking, but yeah, yeah. talking about winning the regular season, I could easily see see that happening. And by the way, Janan Musa is very cheap on the EuroLeague fantasy, so you must I have him on your team. <laughs> I think he was averaging 22 points in five games with Real Madrid, which is crazy when we're talking about the rookie. Uh, for the top Euroleague team and you know watching him offensively he's like preseason. good old yeah and he spent half of the preseason of course he was in a great shape because <laughs> he was on fire with Bosnia Look, but he's I mean, the type of player that he's like Rudy Fernandez offensively I mean this kind of copy of Rudy Fernandez in his best <sighs> days I think that's generous to Rudy honestly because uh, Gianna Musa is not first of all not afraid of anything he's a uh, good ball handler like i said he's being used as a point forward and he can just go from coast to coast through bodies he doesn't care he finishes with contact maybe the question is about his shooting how consistent can he be shooting from free because he tends to take some off balance even very deep free pointers which is not necessarily his biggest strength but honestly the guy has so much talent and and so much motivation as well, because since what happened in an Adolo FS put him on a lower level team eventually in Spain, but he chose to play there and it was a good decision. He was the MVP and now yeah. he's where he really belongs. So Janan Musa, like I said, you must have him on your fantasy team and also you must follow this, this player and his development. He was averaging, he was making three pointers on 45% 
in the Eurobasket yep. and f- he was shooting 40% from the three point line for Real Madrid so far so yeah i hope it's i hope the numbers could stay yeah, like yeah. that probably they won't but as long as he keeps it above like 35 it, it, it's going to be good for the team i have since we discussed these two super copa finalists how did you like the new rule in spain I, I like it in one i like it but at the same time it still has some it brought mixed feelings right too it, many gray areas yeah mm-hmm. gray areas like the opponents t- taking the ball and putting it somewhere on the floor do you give a technical for that or not do you do the thing that uh, we see in football you what you kick the ball so it goes yeah. further out of the court i mean it's time wasting it's it's you cannot game, show a yellow it's... card in basketball you yeah. need to give a technical but I like the idea and I like that the ACB they, League is amazing. being brave enough to try something like this because it will give you more fast breaks, it will give you more dunks and, and more opportunities uh, to catch the defense when it's not set. But also it gives you some dirty plays maybe when when the other team is yeah. disturbing you from, from inbounding the ball and stuff like that. Uh, let's just see how it carries on during the whole season. Right now, players sometimes are not also clear about how this rule is implemented. Like in the El Clasico, uh, in the fourth quarter, when there were less than two minutes left to play, I believe Kalinic wanted to do a quick inbound play, and then the referee had to remind him, this can't. rule only <laughs> works for 38 minutes. <laughs> so yeah. the players will, will need some time adjusting to it. But it could be could lead to something interesting because I think there are some rules in basketball that are old and need to be looked at. Mm. Like NBA is known for for experimenting, especially in the G League, they're trying all sorts of ideas. And I think it's about time in in Europe to try some new things. I like this development, but for me, the perfect uh, balance would be uh, the referees just being faster with passing out of bounds, like. If I see that it's my team ball, my team's ball, I just go and take it. I the ref comes over running to- towards me. I pass him the ball. He quickly gives it back to me, and then I can, you know, this just speed up the process. I think that would be enough because now it's like referees walking slow, looking if there is no and that pass uh, is also like slow. That pass. pass is, you know, this balloon pass, like you're shooting. He a checks if the ball is not. Sweaty. Yeah, it's just to s- speed up the process from the, you know, this pass and pass back perspective. And actually, for me, that would be that would be enough for me. Actually, you know, uh, since ACB League is trying something like this, maybe they should also bring ball boys, <laughs> like like you mentioned football. So why why are they able to do these quick <laughs> throw-ins? Because there's a ball yeah. boy. He's just giving you the ball quickly, and you you're throwing it back on the pitch. If you're pl- playing at home, at home, of course, obviously, that's another advantage of of having your home court. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but I'm just I'm just joking. Obviously, it's good that they're looking for ways to improve the game, speeding up the game in because general. we have so many situations with a lot of pauses. Uh, let's say which makes the game in general uh, longer, but at the same time, it feels like you're watching free and free basketball or something, which doesn't. <laughs> it, it looks I'm, like it doesn't really fit for I'm this highest level. I'm curious to see how it will look like during the season because so far we only had a glimpse at it in yeah. the Supercopa, but. Uh, the ACB regular season starts. I'm, I'm going to watch a lot of games. I'm going to cover a lot of games. So I think there will be some funny or ab- absurd situations because of this rule. But at the same time, we will see more spectacular dunks and fast breaks. So, But this is a good point talking about speeding up the game of basketball because for me, uh, some games are starting to become unwatchable. And it might be me because, you know, the attention span and all this stuff, you know, is getting shorter. But especially, I'm not talking about EuroLeague right now, but let's say our local league in Lithuania, these games that last 40 minutes, you have to watch them for two hours and 30 minutes because of the TV timeouts during every quarter. Uh, then you have coaches timeouts, then you have video reviews, video reviews every two freaking minutes. And uh, it like just becomes, you know, you go to watch a replay for every small detail. And, mm. you know, yeah, I'm all in for the having the correct decision. But I think coach, uh, the refs have to trust, you know, we have to trust the refs more to make mm-hmm. the correct decision. And the refs have to trust themselves more to make the correct decision because it seems like right now for every slight detail where, okay, maybe we're going to look at the detail if this was an enforcement like foul. 
It, I you know which it, which of official review I hate the most? It's about the clock. Oh, when they yeah. need to check whether it's 21 seconds left on the shot clock or is it 19. And it takes takes an hour. I mean, to, if it's the last decide. if it's the last possession, yeah, it's kind yeah. of a big Unless deal, but minutes, if it's like in the middle 6 of the game. minutes 32 seconds remaining in the second quarter, I mean. And I think it starts with the confidence or with the lack of confidence from the referees because maybe they have some second thoughts and they also have this let's say privilege and advantage that you know if something goes wrong and if i don't feel the confident with the call i can always uh, review uh, the play so you know it just makes their yeah. life easier and i think that there's just you know putting too much of an advantage of having this privilege to use the video system. And, and some of the new rules are, you know, let's say uh, on sportsmen like fouls in the last seconds. Come in, come on, just if let's make a rule that if there is less than one minute, you can foul because that's the only way you can win or let's, let's say last 30 seconds. I mean, now every like some teams are afraid to foul in the last 20 seconds because they know that it's going to be an unsportsman like foul. Why not just, you know, let's say, allow teams to foul in the last 30 seconds because this is what keeps basketball interesting in the last minutes. This is what makes for good endings of the game, mm -hmm. comebacks, potentials. I, I actually like the NBA rule, the new rule they brought uh, about stopping the fast breaks because if you intentionally mm, stop one, the yeah, fast break, for sure. that gives you one free throw and the ball. And I think it's a good decision because yeah. two free throws and a ball is maybe... A, too much of a punishment one free throw and the ball like a technical last year was just unwatchable with all these take fouls in the nba yeah. where there was you know no rule like in in the europe they were just grabbing opponents like this and the like an nfl yeah. simple it, foul it's true yeah so should we get back, back to, last, to the ranking? last last team left to talk about uh, yeah last team left because we we've talked about fs we have them as number one you have them as as number three number four actually Num i have barcelona oh, as you number have three number four yeah. yeah i have real madrid as number two and i have milan oh, actually yeah. as number one yeah i go with italians you have milan at yep. number one i think so that they're nice. saying you're saying olympia Mila milano is winning the year league regular season oh come yeah on, we cannot we cannot nah we cannot predict things as as okay, i said okay, without okay. having seven game finals and like i said something. i'm not even predicting i'm just <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, power right. yeah. yeah yeah milan i love what they yeah. did i love what they did in the summer i mean they had the second best free agency next to anadol fs they all, it already had clear. a great team but they suffered too many injuries last season and yeah. they obviously needed a new point guard because chacho got old Malcolm Delaney was always injured, and Never all of a played. sudden Kevin Pangos is available. So that's a no-brainer. And you also add Billy Baron, Nazmi Trulong, Deshaun Thomas. Deshaun Thomas as your forward. And Brandon looking at the Davis. center position is crazy when you have Brandon Davis and Kyle Hines. Both can play like 20 minutes each, and the team will not suffer at all. And Davis gives you the ability to play the inside game offensively. He can play back to the basket, score from the paint. And then you have Johannes Voigtman stretching the floor. Yeah. So these signings are, are amazing. Ettore Messina, when he came back from the NBA, he realized how modern basketball is and how it is different from, from the early 2000s. And every single move he's making is, is oriented to a modern basketball team, the way it is supposed to be defensively and offensively. So I just loved all, all their signings and I can see them having a very good season. For me, they are the team that won the free agent market. And I know Anadolu signed Will Clyburn and that's huge. And they kept Shane Larkin. And, and they kept these two, yeah. But the team that made the most, uh, let's say the biggest step towards winning the title, yeah. I think it's uh, Milano and mm -hmm. Uh, Pangos is a huge upgrade uh, in the place of Malcolm Delaney. Nazmi Trulong could have one of the best seasons that nobody expects from, let's say from him. Uh, they kept the core. If Kyle Hans is still starting, they have four starters that played their last season. So you have some continuity and so all of a sudden you replace these role players into players that on other teams could be starting uh, starting uh, in the starting lineup. 
And for me, the biggest change is also the the center position. When you replace Caleb Terzuski with Brandon Davis and Johannes Voitman, it's crazy to think, you know, then, that's the upgrade you have. It you just had... gives so many more options in the offense. And uh, all of a sudden you have a post presence on that team, which you didn't have in yeah. the center position. And uh, you have, you know, your Tibor Plyce. Let's yeah. say in in Johannes Voidman. So. You have shooting from Billy Barron, from Deshaun and Thomas. And the good thing uh, is that the shooting guards, they're not only shooters. Billy Barron and Devon Hall also help as ball handlers, so they will help a lot uh, yeah. uh, to Kevin Pangos because we remember Pangos playing for Chayo Pasqual. It was just all about him, and and maybe mm -hmm. sometimes it was too difficult for him to carry the whole team. Right now, you have other players who can be ball handlers and creators as well, so it makes it easier for you when you're not so dependent on, on pick and roll every single possession. And the other thing is obviously versatility. Uh, like Siobhan Shields, he can play as a two and as a three. Deshaun Thomas, he can play as a three and as a four. four. Mm -hmm. uh, Johannes Voigtman, he can play as a four and as a five. Nicolo Melli, obviously we see him as a four, but if injuries or something happens, you can also use him as a five. Uh, this team is the best team protected from injuries. Like when you have players that can cover at least two positions adequately, if one or two players get injured, it's not a big problem because you already have the replacements there and you just need to adjust your lineups. I remember last year, uh, I think there was the same perception around the uh, Olympia's team that they had like two rosters for, for two different teams. And they're really good uh, against the injuries, but all of a sudden in the quarterfinal series, you have like six guys uh, or injured or uh, after uh, after COVID virus. And <laughs> so I just hope, you know, we're not jinxing again, again them for this season. I don't think so. They look much better prepared. They look stacked. Just because like last season, their main point guards were aging veterans who have a history with injuries. Yeah. And right now, Kevin Pangos is going to be running the show. At the same time, you know, of course, life is so nice and easy to make have money to make these <laughs> replacements like, as I mentioned, Brandon Davis instead of Caleb Terzuski. So, you know, with, with the money and with the such an increase in the quality, also expectations are increasing. And yeah, if you guys don't see Milan playing in the final, no, the final uh, I think it's a failure. Yeah, of course. To, mm -hmm. to I me, agree. To yeah. me, it's time for Messina to win it. It's not just about building the culture, building the team, but the time. I, I don't know, know about winning this year because or the next it's year. very tough. You're going to yeah. have to win uh, a one game against the team that is just as good as you are. But they are a final four lock. Yeah, yeah, that's you, for sure. You cannot accept no, losing no, no. a playoff series right now. They have to be in the final four. And actually, this whole big four of... of uh, Barca, Madrid, and FS and, and Milan, these are the four teams that must be in yeah. the final four because if any of these teams fail, it will be a, a huge failure. Yeah, yeah, a huge yeah, failure because you can accept Fenerbahce not making it because it's a new team. You can accept Monaco not making it. You can accept Virtus or any other club mm -hmm. that will be in the top eight not winning the series and not being in the final four. But these four teams, they just have to be there. Yeah. Agree. Yeah, so this is it, right? You have FS as your number one. Yeah, FS so my number one, Milano my number two, uh, Madrid my number Milano. three, and Barca number four. Uh, FS, Real, Olympia, Barcelona. Milan, Real, Barca, FS. Maybe I took this power ranking thing pretty wrong. Nah, not nah. necessarily. It depends on you. Because I if you ask for my predictions for the regular season, yeah. The because it was kind of a combination of the power ranking and the prediction, yeah, you know, including yeah. all mean, the mental aspects, especially when it takes good, FS. Yeah, yeah, it's all it's good. It's just so hard, you know, to predict something. So we were predicting the Eurobasket, and remember yeah. how Ooh. it all ended. Ooh. Ooh. that was nice. <laughs> I think Euroleague is easier to predict because it's not a yeah. blitz tournament, but, but, but yeah. still, it's good. there. There, there is going to be some some surprises and some teams that completely falls off, and uh, of course. It's always like that. A great season. But it was... Let me guarantee you that Milan, Milan was winning the Euro League. No, and I'm somebody, kidding. I'm kidding. I just want that to happen. But <laughs> And somebody at the beginning of April will, you know, remind us this this podcast uh, where yeah, we underrated sure. or overrated, overrated some, some of these teams. It always happened like that. It's always going to be a, about, about that person's uh, favorite team. Man, you know? I, I remember even during the Euro Basket, you remember when we kind of 
did this short preview of quarterfinals and we just mentioned that oh yeah slovenia and poland will play damn yeah. later i received a couple of message from from polish fans we never heard of polish fans actually but we didn't say anything exactly exactly <laughs> we just say that they're gonna <laughs> we play just we just gonna play. you know uh, we just you know <laughs> explain the fact not saying anything speaks yeah. louder sometimes we knew something, you know <laughs> we knew something was behind that game yeah so fans are very sensitive yeah. anyways it was a pleasure for you guys to go through all 18 teams yeah it took a lot of effort a lot of time so i hope you enjoyed i uh, hope uh, we will be wrong with some of our power ranking selections for the good of some some of the teams we underrated let's wish best of luck for all the clubs and just let's enjoy especially the basketball monaco. especially in monaco, monaco and especially my especially James, all in for monaco Vitez Vishnauskas, Augustus Vlauskas, Nantas Urbanas. Thanks a lot for watching us. If you like what we are doing, please uh, press like button below this video because it really helps to boost our podcast and subscribe our channel because it helps to grow uh, our channel as well. And of course, uh, visit basketnews.com.